So I was diagnosed with panic disorder and it was really interesting to get that diagnosis mid counseling career. Right, it's like, right. wait, I should be past that. How did I not see this coming? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Literally in the session where I was thinking about this idea, I was like, oh no, I see it coming. Right. I'm not sleeping. I'm hyperventilating. I'm shaking. My focus is off. I'm not eating. Oh, of course this is panic disorder. How do I care less yeah. about yeah. what people think yes. about me? Just stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I knew it. I knew yes. she was going to say Absolutely. that. You heard Just, it. Write that down. Just stop. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fortitude Podcast. We're your hosts, Micah and Sarah. And we have some very special guests on yes. today. It is our counselors, our marriage counselors, our before marriage counselors. <laughs> our everything counselors. Our everything <laughs> counselors. They, they have been instrumental in our marriage. Uh, I always say that they saved our marriage before we got married. Uh, I mean that uh, with, with all my heart. And I'm so excited. I have a list of questions. We might not get to all of them, but there's some, there's some really good ones. I know this is, this is going to help a lot of people. Uh, I believe that, and it's going to bring a lot of value, so I'm really excited. And their names are Dr. Justin and Amanda McNeil. They're spouses, business partners, pastors, life coaches, mentors, counselors, you name it, they do it. Um, and they've been working in ministry and counseling for 10, 10 plus years, over a decade. That's so amazing. And you can tell from the wisdom that they exude. I'm like, how are we the same age with all the wisdom that they have? Yeah, like 21, 23. Yeah, yeah cool. just like that. Right it's there. crazy, the wisdom. But like Micah said, you guys have been so instrumental in our own, our growth and our journey. And I know that your mission is to just help others walk more fully in their own health. So thank you so much for being willing to come on and chat with us. Of course. We love you guys. This is something we've been really excited to do and really just so supportive of what you two have uh, done in launching this and really believe it's going incredible places. So we're happy to be a part. Yeah, we're so honored. Thank you. Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, well, why don't we just dive in? Let's uh, go. You know, and well, do you want to get, why don't you give us just a little bit of a history of you guys, how you got into counseling, you know, uh, you guys are pastors, mm -hmm. counselors, you're a cyclist, All I mean, you, you know, you do so many things. So like, how did you get into this and why is this, do you feel like this is part of your mission? Oh, uh, how long is this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Buckle in folks. Yeah, this, it's a long you, story. You two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so interestingly enough, our journeys are very different, even though our lives have been very parallel since we were children. For me, I knew as a very young teenager that counseling was going to be part of my life. And for me, it's part of my redemption story. Mm -hmm. I navigated tragedy in my family very young, a lot of grief, um, trauma. And I just knew that this was going to be a space that was going to be able to walk alongside others in their pain. And for me, even from a biblical perspective, like the idea of trading the ashes of our life for beauty, mm -hmm. that God can redeem the painful parts of our story. Mm -hmm. And so now every time I get to share a message of hope or encourage someone or sit with someone, whether it's in pain or in joy, it's such a sweet redemption of this is how the pain is being used for beauty. Yeah. Wow. For me, it, it was like around the age of eight when I felt called to ministry. Mm. Interestingly enough, that's when I also met you, which I've never made that connection. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I felt called to ministry and always pictured that looking one way, local church ministry, pastoral ministry, which is like absolutely what my heart is. But then I think as my journey continued, I realized that ministry doesn't have to only be housed in what we consider as like spiritual, but God cares just as much for our hearts, our yeah. minds, and also our body. And so mm -hmm. the more I felt called to lead people and serve them, I realized, well, if I'm going to talk about their spirit effectively, mm -hmm. I have to talk about their mind and their heart. And that's where I really, uh, because of an incredible mentor in, I li in our lives, felt called into counseling and studying and using that as not just a tool, but really a, a gift to serve people. And then eventually later on realizing that like taking care of our physical bodies is important too, yeah. which is where fitness coaching came in. And so it's kind of just been a progressive journey of, I think any counselor would say, like looking into yourself and then helping others do the same. Wow. Yeah. I, well, it's crazy. You say, well, it's not crazy, but when you talk about how much, uh, the physicality goes into your, your thought patterns and in your spirit, it makes sense that it would work hand in hand with your spiritual life as well yeah. and how they kind of go hand in hand, because I've, I've known for, for myself and we've talked about this and how, you know, fitness was, became a really big part of my life mm. and maybe even like started to venture into becoming part of my identity mm -hmm. of like, this is how I look. And so I want to look good mm -hmm. as opposed to 
it, but but it started with like I just want to feel good about you know sure. feel good, and then I think it bled into that. Um, and then I went through an injury in 2014. I had a herniated disc, and that kind of started this wave or ripple effect into other parts of my body starting to get injured and hurt. I have tendonitis in my elbow. I have bursitis in my back. I have I, the disc herniation continues to you know flare up. Um, I have hip. Uh, hip itis i don't know some, <laughs> some sort of hip issue um and Classic. so that was one of the hardest years i would say because i just took a year off of not working out because yeah. i was hoping that that would just solve these issues sure. mm. but then i noticed how much that affected my i mean my mental totally state but then also my spiritual state yeah. and so i don't know if you can talk uh, you know talk more into just that like how important that is in how it's um, all it's all intertwined. Yeah, how it's all intertwined. Yeah. Well, God created us spirit, soul, and body. He he breathed life into our physical beings and he cares about the entire mm. being and also came to redeem the entire being. Like Jesus had to go through a physical life and also physical death and physical resurrection because he's bringing redemption to our physical bodies as well. Mm. And so I think if we aren't careful, we can detach from like that reality and think, oh, well, it's just about my spiritual. But so much about our faith has to be worked out into our physical and the ways that we live and behave and care for ourselves and care for others. And so when you think of these three components, your spirit, your soul, and your body, anytime there's great suffering in one, um, it will affect the others. It's mm -hmm. inevitable. Anytime that we're suffering emotionally, it does affect us physically and spiritually. Mm -hmm. Same thing with our spirit. If we're really in doubt or unbelief, it can show up elsewhere. But also our bodies have to be tended to yep. where your physical state, whether it's injury or going through, you know, some kind of accident, um, it can bring about a physical depression or chemical depression because of your inability to generate endorphins or dopamine. Mm -hmm. And then that can start to affect the way you feel about life. Mm -hmm. It can lead toward hopelessness. So I think think we have to be careful not to just make them three separate boxes we're one person mm -hmm. and god cares about the whole person mm. i would say even science is as it continues to progress we're able to measure those chemicals and hormones in the brain and what effect they have on our body even there was a study done about a decade ago where <clears throat> the thoughts that we think create neural pathways and actually shape the physical organ of the brain in our body mm -hmm. like what else can we do other than working out that shapes our body, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's talking about actually the thoughts that we think and the words that we hear actually have a changing effect, which is why it's so important to guard our hearts, to renew our minds, to be mindful of what we're consuming and what we're thinking and what we're exposing ourselves to because internal emotional things have physical consequences. Totally. Well, in that year, I've that was like the first kind of, the first year where I really started to feel what depression feels like. Mm -hmm. And and that's such a blessing to say, because I know, you know, I know people, there are different levels of depression and, and some people, you know, are, are more clinically depressed than, than others. But I noticed how much correlation was to wanting to, to do more um, hard things mm -hmm. and things that were going to progress my life in other areas. When I took that away, I didn't have the same motivation, the yeah, same drive. Sure. And it was a kind of a, a a hard spiral because then I got a little bit more depressed, which made me not want to do any type mm -hmm. of physical activity. I wanted to go into more comfort yeah. and more, you know, eat just like eat comfort food, binge Netflix, basically um, escape. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was, and we've talked about this in our sessions about feeling a sense of purposelessness that's when I was the most vulnerable to uh, porn, to like go towards that because it was a sense of power or a sense of, uh, of, of getting control over something in my life. And so I don't know where the question is going to go, <laughs> but, but where... Well, I, I, I have a question actually from, okay, great. from something that you shared about the, those neural pathways and how I think it's so easy for we form our habits become... Or our thoughts become habits mm -hmm. and we get used to thinking a certain way, which then leads to us feeling a certain way and then yeah. behaving a certain way. Yep. So if I think it can be difficult for people to, and, and me and Clive fallen into this as well, where it's like, I don't even know 
that I'm going down a mm-hmm. negative thought path because this is it's just so what I'm so used to. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, this is just what, how I think. This is how my brain is wired. But I didn't I didn't realize that's just how my brain was wired. You know yeah. what I mean? So how how can people get out of that spiral? Is mm-hmm. there a way to be like, okay, how do I how do I start to change yeah. those deep grooves yes. that I have formed in my mind and my thoughts and, and the patterns that I've been living out in my life? So I don't know if you ever had this experience when you were a kid where maybe something was like one way at your house, totally normal, and then maybe you go have dinner at a friend's house and they do something really different. Yeah. And you're like, oh, families operate like that? <laughs> like, oh, people use the dishwasher as a drying rack rather than actually to wash their dishes? Like, you find something that's different And it's like a light bulb moment of, oh, not everybody does it the way we do it or the way I do it. I think that kind of exposure to different ways of thinking Mm. is kind of what can wake us up to, oh, there's an alternative. Oh, there's another path. Oh, the way I know might not be the most helpful or the most healthy or Mm -hmm. normal, as some people might say. Like, there's alternatives. And so having some objective perspective can help maybe ignite the trajectory for change. Mm. And I think we're totally biased, but that's where counseling can come in, where you have an objective observer to ask questions, to be curious, to engage you to think in different ways. And I think that's where a lot of light bulb moments can come in. And that's the Mm. start. There's not like this one magic formula. Of course. Here's how I fix my brain. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What we're talking about is something called metacognition. It's thinking about our thinking. Mm. So meta, that higher level of our thoughts. And so often this can look like self-reflection of why do I think that? For example, if you look in the mirror and almost instinctively every time you look, you think, oh, I look fat or I look ugly. Instead of just allowing that thought kind of like free access, Mm -hmm. taking a second to pause and reflect, why do I think that? oh, I just did it again. Even just bringing awareness or bearing witness to your own thoughts can begin the process of change. Because if you can catch that, oh, I did it again. It's I'm not just living in the pattern of this thought, but I actually can take a, a narrative view of it that like, oh, Sarah keeps thinking this about herself. Mm-hmm. Justin keeps thinking this about himself. Then we can start to change it. So if I can catch when I think that negative thought, then I can replace it with a thought that I have crafted intentionally, whether mm-hmm. it's with a counselor, a mentor, or something from scripture, and I can start to replace it. So every time I think, oh, I- I'm not good enough, then I can replace it. Now this is just me telling my own secret. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, I'm not worthy. Mm-hmm. I can think, no, I'm chosen, I'm loved, I'm called. And mm-hmm. that's not something I made up. It's something I chose to to adhere to from scripture Mm -hmm. right so but i kind of use those negative thoughts as triggers of like oh there it is so now i'll replace it with something positive and i i've fallen into that too where where i'm like okay i gotta catch my thoughts and i gotta speak against that and speak the opposite Mm -hmm. but in the beginning it feels phony oh totally yeah because the brain will resonate not with what is true but what is familiar Mm. Mm -hmm. Your brain will always resonate with what is familiar. So if I have told you something a hundred times, if I've told you you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. Let's say you grew up with that in your home and then you move away, move across the country, start a career. And then one person at work says you're stupid. It resonates because it feels familiar to Mm. you. Right. And so that identity is kind of like latched onto as opposed to maybe the 10 other people that are like, wow, you're really smart. Even though it's nice, Mm -hmm. it doesn't resonate because there is a pattern there. And so at the beginning, it does feel phony. It does feel, because we're talking about deep grooves versus this tiny, uncharted pathway. But with some time, you can change that. It's what's fascinating about our brains. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what can be challenging in our growth journeys in so you used an example of like a work environment, but even in a relationship, mm. if it's like, wow, you're, you're so funny. I love being around you. Our brain can try to protect us from what we believe is actually true and wow. go like, oh, well, they're just saying that to be nice or they're just saying that because they want something from me. Mm. And so it can be hard to even receive love and engage in healthy community and connection. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, identity is so, it's so powerful. And, but then, but then you, you hear about stories how you can't just blame your upbringing Mm-mm, for sure. and, and use mm-hmm. that as your excuse for whatever that is, whether it's a good upbringing. Because I, you hear both stories, somebody with a good and great upbringing that, you know, commits suicide. Mm-hmm. At the, that's the most dramatic versus somebody that 
I mean, I was just listening to Tony Robbins and he had a pretty awful upbringing, mm -hmm. abusive, you know, thrown across the room and, um, you know, alcoholic uh, mother and different things like that turns out, you know, and then turns into uses that to turn into what he's uh, done. So what causes somebody to, to do one or the other? How much of that is just wired or how mm. much of it is like they got inspiration from somebody else? Like mm. what, what would you say? Um, because there are people listening, uh, myself included, that can, that can use their upbringing or, or, you know, it's just not fair. I wasn't, you know, born with a spoon, you know, a silver spoon in my mouth or I, any, any or, circumstance. Right. Yeah. What causes somebody to just go one way or the other way, you know? I think it has a lot to do with owning your story, mm -hmm. like being able to face it honestly and with extreme ownership and uh, being able to look at the good and the ugly in your story because everyone has both. Mm -hmm. Everyone has both. Yep. And Brene Brown says, if we can't own our story, we're always going to hustle for our worth outside of it, mm. right? Like That's until good. I can own my story for what it is and own the good and the bad, it's going to be hard for me to use it the way you're describing because mm -hmm. I'm ignoring a part of it, right? So like I grew up in a very like traditional home and on the outside, I always used to say like, oh, everything was good. Everything was good, but no situation's perfect. Mm -hmm. And until I could admit to myself through my own counseling journey of like, oh, there's some things I need to heal from. I was never able to access those parts of myself. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of my dysfunction came from because we're not acknowledging what's true. So we're avoiding it. That's kind of like what you were referring to earlier, Micah, when uh, your injury started to bring about these symptoms that felt like new depression, like I've never felt feelings like this. I mean, you and I started talking much later after that injury, but even still, I observed a lot of fixation in you where you would be like, Justin, I, it's hurting. It, I, it's all I can think about. But we can get very distracted by the circumstance and ignore what's beneath it, mm. right? So that's where a lot of times I would try to point you to the notions of powerlessness, why they affect you so much, mm. the identity issue that mm. you that you mentioned. And when we can face those things that are beneath our circumstance, when we can own our story that way, it's hard and you have to kind of like go into the belly of the beast a mm. bit. Mm -hmm. But if I can show up bravely into my story, I mm. don't need my escape tactics. Mm. So things like porn addiction, wow. things like coping mechanisms, defense mechanisms, binging, mm -hmm. they are my attempt to get away from the monster versus, no, I'm ready to own this for what it is. Mm -hmm. Like I think a healthy person can say, I know my issues. I know what they are and I don't have to hide in shame from them. Mm -hmm. I don't need yep. to like escape from this intense reality mm, mm -hmm. i think that's where a lot of change happens yeah mm. i think that the blaming the finger pointing is mm. the easy way out mm. because well it takes the pressure off me mm -hmm. i don't have to do anything and to be clear in childhood our parents or our caregivers are the ones responsible to meet our needs emotionally and physically to teach us to protect us to the best of their ability mm -hmm. and we all have um stories of where that failed or that wasn't present in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So in childhood, it is our parents and caregivers responsibility. But when we become an adult, mm. the responsibility shifts to us mm. of, I do have to be honest with my story. And even in a traditional or healthy family or circumstance, yeah. we all experience measures of lowercase T trauma that if we mm. aren't honest about whether that's because, Oh, well, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus sure, or I don't want to, um, look disloyal or, or have my story is not as bad as someone else's story mm. right or like if i actually am honest about this maybe that means my love isn't genuine mm. and so we can avoid being honest but if we aren't honest with our story we actually can't heal mm -hmm. and move forward and no one can do that for you so the responsibility is on us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. wow do you think that it's possible for someone to have to go on that journey completely on their own mm. because for for me I wouldn't have been able to realize the things I needed to heal from if I hadn't have had a counselor be like, hey, what I'm hearing in your, this is what I'm hearing in your story, but I think it's actually this thing that is, that's painful for you. So maybe we dig into that. And I would have never, it's a whole other topic, but like we just don't get taught like proper emotional intelligence and awareness a lot of the time as we as we grow up. Yeah. So I, I don't think I would have be, been able to realize those things without a third party. So do you think that that's even possible? Are you able to become self-aware without yeah. somebody else? <laughs> okay, question. Sarah? Yeah. 
Are you able to be unbiased with yourself? Pro- I mean, I, I think more so than I used to be able to be, for sure. But completely, no. Because yeah. I'm me, right. I'm me. <laughs> exactly. Yes. One of my favorite psychologists, like he writes obviously a lot of books and they're in the self-help category and he hates it. He's like, there's no such thing as self-help. You're literally reading a book that I wrote based on my education, based on other people's experiences. And so self-help isn't a thing. We are actually designed for community. Mm. I've also heard it said we are broken in community and we need to be healed through community. Mm. Wow. Peter Levine says that trauma is not what happens to us. It's what happens in us in the absence of an empathetic witness. Mm. Mm. So if I don't have someone who is attuned to me with empathy, I have to self-contain. And this is why a lot of our trauma is in childhood Mm -hmm. because either your caretaker could not or would not, for whatever reason, attune to you. So without an empathetic witness, you had to self-contain. And based on our temperaments or our experience, self-containment can look like medicating. It can look like internalizing. It can look like, it can look like blaming. But trauma is that moment where I do not have someone who can empathetically witness what's going on in me. Mm. And so to your point, Sarah, I think part of the healing is not just, oh, I'm better or, oh, I feel better, but it's I allowed relationship to be safe enough to share this part of myself that I shut down so long mm-hmm. before. So if, if the question is like, does every single person need counseling and therapy? I think that's up for argument, mm-hmm. but every single person needs safety in relationship. Mm. Yeah. And if we can heal based on the level of our trauma, I think you guys are a great example of how your marriage can just go from romance to true emotional intimacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause like if your walls are up, you actually can't empathetically witness each other. You can't mm-hmm. be there for each other if you have your own self containment. But as you heal, you can share yourself with another person and there's healing in that. There's healing in your marriage because of it. Mm-hmm. Healing in our marriage, healing in family, mm-hmm. healing in friendships when two people can really be open to one another. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a child actually cannot self-regulate their emotions. Mm. They have to co-regulate with a regulated adult. Um, as parents, well, that's real challenging because yeah, many I times I don't want to be regulated. Yeah. So. Many times you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Again, to whatever measure we were able to receive that or learn how to regulate with our regulated adult or caregiver in childhood, We have different advantages, different life experiences as we all grow up. So we, the ultimate goal is to get to self-regulation as a healthy adult. However, if we didn't learn that skill or we don't have a lot of practice now, instead of self-regulation, we'll go to Mm -hmm. self-soothing, which is where the indulgences and the addictions and the quick fix Mm -hmm. to feel better or to feel like compensation for my pain comes Mm. in. And so that's a, that's, I mean, that's a hard thing to learn that difference of, Mm -hmm. okay, I have to develop discipline to have healthy self-regulation rather than just self-soothe all my issues. Mm, That's good. Can you, just because I know that I needed this defined, can you like say what self-regulation means? Yeah. Because that's just something that I didn't know what that was Mm -hmm. until someone taught me what it was. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So it's actually a combination of emotional and physiological. Mm. So when we are in a regulated state, our brain is functioning as it should be. So the hormone levels are what they should be. I don't have a surge of adrenaline because I'm not fearful or I'm not ready to attack. Mm. Um, My dopamine levels are where they're supposed to be. Mm. My oxygen intake is at a healthy place. I'm not short of breath or holding my breath. Everything is as it should be internally, Mm -hmm. which then allows us to actually be present Mm -hmm. in conversation, Mm -hmm. to be creative in problem solving, to be a little bit more unbiased. If I'm regulated and I'm cut off in traffic, I might have a little more grace, like, oh, God bless you, buddy. Hope you get (laughs) to where you're going safely. Mm -hmm. Um, She's never said that to anyone, by the way. (laughs) Traffic is a test, (laughs) let me tell you. Much more of a saint than I am. Exactly. (laughs) Clearly, I'm not very regulated when I drive. But um, when we are dysregulated, that's where our hormones are functioning or firing off in an irregular way 
away because our brain believes we are at threat. Mm. And our brain fires off these signals, whether the threat is physical, like Mm -hmm. I'm walking in the woods and there's a bear in front of me, Mm -hmm. or emotional. My boss kind of gave me that one look out of the corner of his eye. Mm. Or my my partner didn't text me back fast enough. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a physical or emotional threat, our brain responds the same way. I have to protect myself Mm. against this threat. And even if it's an actual threat or a perceived threat. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, you're walking in the backyard and you jump like, oh, there's a snake. If you didn't run away, you might have had the moment to go, oh, it's just a hose. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter. The brain responded as if it was a threat. And so we get dysregulated. So to be emotionally regulated, we are getting our brain and our body and our breath back to a healthy place. Based on the level of getting either triggered or dysregulated, sometimes that takes just a few seconds. Mm -hmm. It could be just taking a a breath. It's a hose. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But if there was like a very serious fight between you and your significant other Mm -hmm. or uh, some kind of trauma, you got terrible news, you're going to be dysregulated in a much more severe way. And taking two quick breaths may not provide the kind of regulation. You may need support. You may need some some additional help to regulate. But self regulation is kind of that moment by moment ability to get back to a place of compassion like Mm. we're having a conversation right now we're listening but if someone started pounding on the door Mm. as much as you wanted to pretend that you were listening (laughs) your attention is like over there Uh like like, you couldn't we're just not going to acknowledge that (laughs) right (laughs) you couldn't hear and connect with what we're talking about Mm -hmm. because your brain is telling you something's wrong something's wrong Mm. and so self-regulation is the ability to say okay either i need to address it or i have to release it but i have to come back to the moment Mm. Mm. Well, and when we have a history of trauma, to be able to separate this situation is not what I previously went through. Mm -hmm. Um, This is not that. And so it feels unsafe, but I actually am safe. I actually can regulate myself. I actually can calm down because it doesn't feel safe, Mm -hmm. but I am safe. Mm -hmm. And that takes a long time to build those pathways. Yeah. And that's self-trust. Yeah. It's so easy to just like... When, when you're not aware or if, you, if you haven't been brought, like if you haven't had these thought patterns or um, your patterns brought to your attention, it can just be easy to fall victim to your emotions. Mm-hmm. And just like whatever emotion you're, you're going through, you just kind of ride that out instead of taking a moment to be like, why did this thing trigger me? And that's, that's something that I, I've done. It's like um, just the other it was just like a last week or a couple of weeks ago, I was just feeling really overwhelmed by starting this podcast and also doing, you know, working you full time. It. You did it. You know, <laughs> you and, got through. And, and I'm so also sorry doing, we're here. And, uh, <laughs> you guys overwhelmed me. Um, <laughs> no, it was just, it was just a moment because anytime you start anything brand new, yeah. you're putting so much capacity mm-hmm. uh, into that. And then it was doing that while working full time, while doing our social media, while doing our e-commerce business. And it was just like all at once, and so I, she could, she can know, she knows by now when I'm getting overwhelmed or whether I, I'm off and it's just like, what's, what's going on? I just had to like take a step back of being like, I'm not dying, Yeah, <laughs> you know? And it like, I know that's such a simple like thing to, and kind of a silly thing, it's but real. it's, it's like our, our brain, when you get into these emotional states, it just automatically thinks like, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm going to mm-hmm. die, I'm going to mm-hmm. die. And it's just like, the, you, you kind of have to, I, I just had to speak out what is factual. Yeah. Where it's like, okay, I'm yes. fine. It's a this grounding is a, this statement. This is a moment. Mm-hmm. This is just like, the, this is not going to be forever. Mm-hmm. That's been kind of a motto of mine. It's just like, this is only temporary. Yeah. And this is for good and for bad. Yeah. Um, and it, it's like, why am I really overwhelmed right now? Well, because I'm starting this brand new venture that's, you know, taking a lot of my capacity while trying to do these other things. So this may just take up my capacity at the moment, but it's not going to be forever. Anything that you do over time, you're going to need less capacity because you're just going to get better at it and you're just going to learn these skills. Mm. And so when I walked myself through out loud, I just... I mean, I helped. Definitely (laughs) helped. You definitely helped. I helped you walk through that out loud. I'm saying if somebody is alone or, (laughs) you know, it doesn't have somebody like there, um, that's that's a, uh, I don't know if technique or a tool is the right word, but that has helped me of just stating what is factually going on right now. Uh, and and kind of bring it back to like why 
is this heightened emotion happening right now? Contrast that with what Micah of four years ago would have done with that same feeling. Um, exploded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or no, just just like I would have faltered to my uh, escapisms. Yes. Of like porn, mm -hmm. of, of just like, I, d I just need to like, I don't want to feel this way. Yeah. And so I'm going to go towards something that gets my brain off of it instead right. of, <laughs> which is like, you know, you think about it, it's like, well, why do you go to destructive <laughs> thought patterns and destructive ways to escape? Mm -hmm. because, but that's just like what I did. Because we want to feel better instead of mm -hmm. be better. We're looking for mm -hmm. self-soothing, mm -hmm. not self-regulation. Wow. And two of the primary triggers for uh, sexually addictive behavior and really most addictive behavior is stre being stressed when we are stressed and we don't have healthy coping mechanisms for our stress, uh, like if you think of the word stressed, if you look at it backwards, it's desserts. And that's what usually <laughs> we, we go you after. You are that's <laughs> funny. I've never yeah. heard that. How do I, why am I just <laughs> yes. figuring this so out? So we look at our stress and we flip it around and we're like, I just want something that feels good. I just want something to make me feel better. Mm. But we don't actually cope with the stress in a healthy way. We don't actually change wow. anything. And another would be the feeling of overwhelm. Um, that, that triggers us. Also boredom, feeling just stuck mm. and purposeless. We end, we end up wanting to entertain ourselves or create some kind of spike in our adrenaline or dopamine but you're illustrating it so well is that your escapisms in the past just led you in circles as opposed to this radical honesty of like micah here's what's happening let me talk myself through it let me do what i need to do maybe i need a break maybe i need to calm down maybe i need to tend to the real need within me but it's this kind of owning of what's happening in your soul i mean on that topic i feel like anxiety right now is more rampant than ever. Um, I think social media, honestly, has a huge part of that because people just have access to information at all times, and it's in your face, mm. uh, which you know kind of is ironic because we're that's a part of our career. When you were talking about self regulation, that got me wondering if that's related to anxiety or an uh, an inability mm. to self regulate causes obviously anxiety comes in many different forms and at many different levels, mm -hmm. but I've never thought of that as kind of like just the base level of what's going on inside being the thing that we need to come back to if we're having an anxious moment. So are those things, do you find those things to be tied together, anxiety and inability to self-regulate? 100%. It's cl <laughs> clinical. Yes. Okay. So anxiety is being dysregulated in an elevated way. So that's where stress, that's where um, fear, that's where anger is. Anxiety and anger are both uppers emotionally. Mm. Elevated heart rate, shortness of breath, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, all of those kind of anxious up kind of feelings. And it can feel like everything is chaotic around me because it feels like everything is chaotic within me. Mm. And so to address anxiety, we have to learn how to bring ourselves down. So slowing our breath down. And there's lots of different tools and breathing techniques and strategies, um, but we have to bring ourselves down. Conversely, depression is a downer. Mm. And that is um, being dysregulated in the opposite direction. And so when we are in shame or in depression, mm. we have to learn how do I regulate myself up to get back to that healthy middle space. Yeah, I really relate to that idea, the inability to self-regulate. Um, so I was diagnosed with panic disorder and it was really interesting to get that diagnosis mid-counseling career. Right, it's like, right. wait, I should, be, I should be past that. How did I not see this coming? Yeah, exactly, yeah. literally in, in, in the session where I was really thinking about this idea, I was like, oh, oh no, I see it coming. <laughs> like I, it, I didn't see it in myself, but once the dots started to connect, I was like, I'm not sleeping, I'm hyperventilating, I'm shaking, my focus is off, I'm not eating. Oh, of course this is panic disorder, mm -hmm. but even in it, even as someone who bears witness to others in it, I couldn't see it for myself because of how pervasive it was. Mm -hmm. And prior to that diagnosis in my life, I was, you know, I'm, I'm a church kid through and through. So I was very positive and optimistic and just like, let's pray about it. God's good. We're just going to get through. But that, that kind of pushing mentality of just push through it, it became way less about faith for me. And it became a, a, a cover up mm. for denial mm. of real honest emotion. I was using my faith to over spiritualize things and get into denial. The inability to say, I'm actually really, really sad. or I'm actually really angry about this. I would just say, God's good. We're just going to pray. I mean, you, she can tell you like in the first 10 years of our marriage, I almost never 
ever said anything like i'm sad i'm angry it was actually one of the biggest conflicts in our marriage because i was like i'm the negative one he's the positive <laughs> one like yeah. nothing ever bothers him i uh, must be great like i must be picky and you know yeah. i just never brought those emotions to the surface because of my own trauma mm. and so at a pretty significant juncture in our story i had all this unprocessed grief my best friend died when in the second month or third month of our marriage. Prior to that, I'd never lost anyone or anything except mm-hmm. a cat. So like <laughs> I'd never suffered grief. Mm-hmm. My best friend dies in this really, really painful um, turn of events in the second month of our marriage. And so I just like shut down. I did not want to access my grief. I had no foundation for it. And I'm leading, I'm pastoring, I'm a new husband, just trying to show up as best I could Mm. for everyone, including my best friend's widow, his infant daughter after his death. And so I never took the chance to even explore what was going on in me. I just pushed it all down as much as I could. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, after still never processing the grief, I found myself in a situation that triggered it all. I was performing a funeral for someone that happened to have my name and just the trauma of that situation and witnessing a whole room of people talk about someone with my name. Even that by Uh itself is kind Mm -hmm. of tricky, Uh but with this unprocessed grief in the middle of me talking, I felt like I I pulled a muscle in my chest. Like at the last few minutes, I felt myself have to grip the podium and afterward I got in my car and I just like couldn't breathe quite the same. Mm -hmm. And I imagined I'm just sad. That's what I told myself. She was used to me coming home from funerals and being a little off for 30 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. But that night wasn't really the same. I couldn't sleep. I didn't really tell her about it, but I was like gasping for air and not able to, to really rest. Didn't sleep much. Tried to just go to work the next day, do the same thing. And it progressed increasingly for the course of three months where my panic attacks were so violent and so visceral couldn't breathe, couldn't sleep, laying in bed, just gasping, sweating, shaking. And I couldn't tell what it was going on with me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I was having a physical issue. Mm -hmm. I I was like, maybe my workout was too hard or maybe I'm not working out enough. Like I was so oblivious to what was going on Mm -hmm. and it was so interruptive to me until eventually it reached a breaking point where unfortunately it took me months to tell her what was happening, but I had to give words to it. I had to seek professional help and I had to acknowledge, whoa, there's this thing that is 10 years old in me that I've never addressed Mm. and my inability to regulate through those emotions is now all exploding in my life. Anxiety typically is this eruption of emotion saying that you You've maybe missed something. Mm. You need to pay attention to what's going on in you. And I think that, yeah, it's rampant in culture for a lot of reasons. One in eight students can be diagnosed with an anxiety wow. disorder. Yeah. Like it's, there's a lot of factors, but ultimately it's because of an inability to regulate. I'm not paying attention to what's going on in me. And so it's kind of overflowing into my life. Wow. Mm. And I feel like that can happen so much in people of faith and people in the leadership role where you 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 feel this responsibility to be good and mm-hmm. to be positive at all at all times mm-hmm. and you can't voice out these yep. things because then you would seem weak mm-hmm. um and so i i, I think that ha- what are you about to say some well i was gonna say that's probably not probably that's part of the reason why this continues mm-hmm. because if we aren't honest about the full range of our experience we aren't being present no. yes god is good yes I am in pain. Mm. Both of those can be true at the Mm. same time. Mm -hmm. So what are some tangible, like, how did you, and maybe you could speak on your experience, but then also like people that have maybe more severe clinical anxiety. uh, What are some tools or I don't like the word cope, but ways to manage that on a daily basis for people that struggle with that on a daily basis. I actually want to start on the other end of the spectrum because I think the more severe and clinical we get, the more specific the solutions, but there's a lot of general anxiety, general anxiety and social anxiety Mm. are probably some of the most rampant Mm -hmm. and we have to pay attention to the contributors to those factors. I was going to say socially, it's even become acceptable as a joke. Like I have party anxiety. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the Sunday scaries, like all of these things are very openly talked about. Mm -hmm but not necessarily addressed. Yes. And people chew with their mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> What's that called? That's like a something phobia. I where, don't know, where, but it's, oh, I've got it. Yeah, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> Sarah <laughs> does have it. 
and I well I because I've had allergies my whole life and I so Tell I, us the I whole allergies. Story. So <laughs> buckle up. <laughs> this is gonna be the next two hours. No, but but I so I couldn't breathe out my nose at, at all. I've had allergy shots, and so I have gotten I've gotten the habit. Yeah, you you know where this is going of eating. Because I can't breathe. For medical reasons. I literally can't yeah. breathe yeah. otherwise. I'm like, I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, she, she's like, <laughs> I you either suffocate you. or yeah. we're done. Yeah. <laughs> like, I need you to shoot with your mouth closed. That's amazing. Please. <laughs> like, like, go. And I, here we are after counseling and, <laughs> and, 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 and getting two different uh, pl- like nose jobs. Uh, I, I broke my nose twice. And I'm like, you couldn't have made it smaller after after <laughs> oh you like, did surgery. Well, we're in there. Got, just two birds. <laughs> One surgery is like correct the debated septum, please. Okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> there are actually all these general anxieties, social anxieties that I think people deal with in a more broad way than mm-hmm. ever before. And we have to be honest about the contributing factors to that. You mentioned one that I think has to be addressed, and it's the constant exposure or inundation of information that we get from social media. Mm-hmm. It's to a degree like never before. Mm-hmm. You can see things so rapidly, and it's so much information that your brain is processing. And of course, we know there are some good qualities to that, the fact that we're in an age where you can get information quicker than ever, but we have to be aware of the threats of it as well. That in one day, you can have seen more stimuli than a person 50 years ago might have seen in a year, Mm -hmm. maybe in their life, right? Right? And so the brain is processing all of that and it makes it very hard to be um, self-aware because you're thinking of everything else around you and it creates uh, what I like to call like this constant conversation with the entire world. I'm hearing and seeing everything around me so it's very hard for me to find stillness or peace within me. Very hard for me to be present with a person that I love. All of these qualities help us come down out of anxiety, but because we're half on our phone and Mm. half listening to Mm. someone else, we never get the attunement. Mm. We never get the the kind of empathetic connection because we're just always moving. And so things like social anxiety and general anxiety have a lot to do at first with the noisiness of our heart and of our soul. I've never, yeah, because I've never considered myself an anxious person. I don't like, I don't fall to that, but but just in the past couple of years, and I think it's probably because we've been on social a lot more. It definitely is. It's no, it's definitely what that <laughs> is, is I, my anxiety comes from when, when I like take, when I find the root of where, when I feel myself getting anxious, it's from envy. Mm-hmm. It's like rooted in envy in comparison because I'm, you know, looking at how other people are growing on, uh, you know, or um, how other people are succeeding or getting brand partnerships or, you know, different things that I then start to envy as opposed to celebrate. Mm-hmm. And like we talked about that, we talked a lot about that actually <laughs> in, in, in our uh, sessions about like turning uh, envy into celebration, which is again, it feels phony yeah. in the beginning when you start to do that. Good job. <laughs> so like, happy I'm for so you. Happy for you. <laughs> what an uh, amazing partnership. Yeah. So there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of different ways you can be anxious, right? So here's a question about that because I think a lot of people uh, probably struggle with, it. No, I'm probably the only one, but the struggle with comparison <laughs> and envy. So w- for somebody who really wants to, grow in their career or their business or their job, you can learn from other people's successes yeah. and and like re- do research. So how can somebody, this is my question. How <laughs> Submitted can you, by Michael. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how can you research and take inspiration from people that have done what you want to do successfully without slipping into comparison and envy? I think that your question is something that all of us have to contemplate because you can start with good intentions of let's say i'm going to follow this person because i love what they're doing and you're really inspired by them or learning from them but then somewhere down the road you're like self-loathing and now you're down on yourself and every time you look at what they do you start to hate what you do first of all that's an indicator that it's gone too far Mm -hmm. but i think the slip that you're talking about of i was trying to learn and now i'm in envy or jealousy is that we have this Um, really twisted way of interpreting information. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be learning from someone, you're learning from their actions. You're learning from what they do and how they do it, drawing inspiration from that. It's a very action-based 
perspective. The problem is when we take someone else's actions and then we compare it and twist it to our identity. Mm. So when you look at what Mm. someone else is doing and you think, okay, I'm going to look at what they're doing. That's great. But then you start to compare it to your own worth or identity and forget that you should just compare it to what you're doing. Mm. Not who I am, not if I'm good or as good as them. Just, hmm, they edit their stuff like this. How do I edit my stuff? That's how you can learn or Mm. benefit. Keep it strictly to the action. But Mm. very often we don't stop at the action. Mm -hmm. It's they are better than me. I'm worse than them. And so we're looking at someone else's actions and interpreting it to some kind of assault on our identity. Mm. And we have to keep those things separate. In fact, you know you've gone too far in, in that comparison game if you are comparing someone else's actions to your own worth. Mm. That's too far. It's, if it's if it's going to be inspiration, let it strictly about what someone's doing, be about what someone's doing mm-hmm. and how you can glean from it. But the minute it starts to hit your identity, I think it's crossed the line. Mm. Oh. That's, That's exactly good. where I was going because if we are secure in our identity, we actually can celebrate somebody else's win mm-hmm. because that shifts it. And it even, I think, exposes a measure of kind of a lack mentality mm-hmm. of like, there won't be enough opportunities for me yep. or the book was already written. What, why should I contribute my idea or my thing? Um, and, and recognizing, wait, if this is who I am, if this is who I'm meant to be, if this is who I'm called to be, there's reason and there's purpose behind it. And I'm not called to be perfect. I'm not called to be a bestseller. Maybe even I'm called to be faithful. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, and I think this is where faith can come in too, of trusting that if God's given me resource or a dream or vision, Mm. he's again, not asking us to execute it to perfection. He's asking us to be faithful and he'll do the multiplication. Wow. Mm. That's so good. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. I think another mistake that we make is we want just what someone, one part of what someone has. Mm. I want that success or I want that charisma. Absolutely. And we're unwilling to accept everything else that comes with that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like that person's ability, that person's ability to access their emotions. Well, that might come from deep heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And are you sure you want that if you're not willing to accept what came with it? Mm -hmm. Right? Like there's no way for us to just isolate one part of a person's story and say, oh, wow, he's such a dynamic leader. Well, maybe it's because he was in a completely traumatic situation that that was fashioned in. Mm -hmm. So we got to be really cautious not to just draw out parts of a person's story. Again, we are holistic beings. And if you can own your story well, yes, you're aware of some of your limits, but you should also be very aware of what you contribute like nobody else does, Mm -hmm. right? It's not overinflated, but I know what I bring into a space that nobody else does. And that can be enough if I'm really aware of it. Mm. Wow, Mm -hmm. that's so good. Correct me if I'm wrong, like what I'm hearing when it comes to like kind of general anxiety, a lot of awareness is a big piece of how we can like help ourselves with with that and like kind of bring ourselves down from that. Yeah. Is that, is my interpretation correct? Yes, (laughs) absolutely. Awareness, mindfulness, and then moving into acceptance. Like those are all really important postures. Well, because again, if we have a need, but we don't know about it, how can we fill it? Mm. So, you know, our early marriage, I feel like trained me for motherhood because someone has a tendency to get hangry. Mm. Someone. Just like anybody in this room. Yeah. Yeah. It could be hypothetically. (laughs) And so hypothetically, I learned to just keep snacks in my bag at all times. (laughs) That's why we fed you before this. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So if there's a need, but we're numb to it Mm -hmm. or we're making excuses for it or we think it's silly and it shouldn't be a need, Mm. then we're not going to meet it. And then we are functioning out of dysfunction. Mm. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we've been talking about seems to be wrapped in identity and like where your identity comes from, whose your identity comes from. Who? Yeah. Like who your identity (laughs) comes from. Capital (laughs) W. But, but we're, I mean, but if people say, you know, but people operate in their identity from maybe what their parents said Mm. to them or what their friends say about their titles, their accomplishments. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like totally like their Mm -hmm. career and Mm -hmm. you put your identity in, in, I think what you, um, what you value most. Mm. And so when it comes, we live in such a, I mean, the social media era, um, I think anxiety, uh, another thing that plays into anxiety is just caring what people think. Ooh. Is there any like tangible things that you can 
start to work on for people that do really care about what other people think. Mm. And so how do you tangibly not care what people think? How do I care less yeah. about yeah. what people think yes. about me? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Just stop. Yeah. yeah. No, I knew right. it. I knew she was going to say Absolutely. that. You heard just it. Write that down. Yeah, don't. Just stop. <laughs> no, I think, um, I think we have to get in touch with what need that's exposing. Mm. And now this is going to get deep. It's getting honest. Like, why... Why do I think about what they think of me? Mm. Why do I give so much credit in that achievement or in that person's praise or in that mention or whatever it is mm -hmm. or in my paycheck or in my degree or yeah. could be anything. Mm -hmm. And being honest will help kind of reveal some roots of where you have opportunities for more growth and healing. Because I think it's going to be very individual, individual per person, but sometimes even per circumstance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like this circumstance is revealing this dynamic in my life. I don't think we can ever fully shut that off. Totally. <laughs> I wish we could. I don't think it's about not caring what people think. I think it's more about placing that care on the right people, the mm. right sources. Mm -hmm. We get very anxious when we place it in the wrong sources. Mm. So as a person of faith, first and foremost, I have to ask myself, what does God think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what does he say about me? And I start there. And then I have to determine whose words and perspective carries the most weight. My wife under God is right there. Mm -hmm. Like she's so other people might think, wow, he works so much and he does so much. But if my wife, this is a very real life example, is like, you're doing too much. You haven't had dinner with our family. I have to be attuned to that because she gets priority. Like you said, value in my life. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you the visualization I have clients usually do is like imagine your life on a stage not hard for you guys <laughs> imagine your life on a stage with all of these people spectating fun fact we were in the same room with you before we ever met you we actually went to see beauty and the beast when you guys were on tour oh yeah i forget it all crazy. the time yeah. we were watching your show before we ever knew each other so <laughs> it's funny how yeah. god meant for our paths to cross and we didn't realize it till later yeah. but we were sitting in the very far back of that theater, like like so far away. And if you picture your life like this, with your life on a stage and all these people watching, so often we're trying to impress people who paid the least for their seats. Wow. <laughs> like, mm. So I, I always tell people that the loudest boos come from the cheapest seats. Mm -hmm. They're the people who are texting during your show. I wasn't, but you know, they're the people who are texting. <laughs> Just when like, we were on stage. Yeah. <laughs> Just oh, only your part. <laughs> Specific. There's some about this guy. It's just I, I cannot watch check him. my emails. <laughs> but like people who are not invested in your life mm -hmm. are going to have the harsh criticism of your life because first of all, they're not invested. Too, they have one of the worst views. Wow. But the people who have are front row. They've invested. They've been present for the story. They have demonstrated their care and trust. Those are the people that you need to be attentive to their input on. Mm -hmm. If someone who's in your inner circle is like Micah, you're really off on this one you probably need to take it into consideration right? Mm -hmm. versus um, some stray comment on your social media that's mm -hmm. like, you're weird, mm -hmm. right? Like, th sorry, you, you're you not, you don't get that kind of access yeah. into mm -hmm. my life because mm -hmm. otherwise we're constantly adjusting to every person's expectation of yep. us. So I, I don't think that we can, like I said, we can't shut off our care of what others think. We just have to determine who our they is. And what I mean mm. by that is we always think of what are they thinking? Let's mm -hmm. determine who your they is. Is it five mm. people, 10 people, family? That's really good. Determine whose voices matter and then stick with that. Mm. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, because there's, so, sometimes we, we just like want, uh, get into people pleasing mode and we just want everyone to like you. Mm -hmm. and But then you're doing that to people that may not even be in your life a year later, mm -hmm. like, or, or two years later, or, or even six months later. Mm -hmm. And you're putting so much of your, 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 your capacity into their thoughts about you mm -hmm. when they are, it's probably just a reflection of what they're going through yep. that they're kind of dumping onto you. Right. Totally, totally. Or you're projecting your own insecurities to yeah. onto them. Mm -hmm. Like you're thinking about what they are thinking about you. Mm -hmm. In reality, it's just your own insecurity. 100%. <laughs> they, they ain't thinking about They're you, They're not probably. thinking yeah. about you. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's thinking about themselves. Yeah. 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 All right. So to kind of 
close it down. We could go on for hours with this conversation. Yeah, but we'll have to do another, please. another we definitely, or, or part three. Part two, three, four, five. <laughs> yeah. um, what are some of those tools that people can use on a daily basis if they're having, if they're struggling with anxiety, maybe they have something that triggers them um, just when they're going about their daily business. What's what's that? I mean, obviously there's there's a wide range of emotion, depression, things that people deal with on a daily basis, but just some basic tools that people can employ to just kind of ground them when they're having one of those moments. Yeah, I think the the first statement we would make is that if someone needs help, it's important that they ask for help. Yes. To seek out help from a trusted source, um, being able to even voice that, hey, I'm not doing okay, I need help. Whether that's with a counselor, a spiritual leader, a mentor, a trusted friend, someone that can actually hold that space for you, mm -hmm. that's always step number one. Mm -hmm. But to answer some practical things, um, if you are feeling flooded with anxiety, for example, you find yourself anxious, overthinking, short of breath, like like I explained for myself. One of the simplest techniques that, that we can use, something called grounding, helping us come back into our body, back into the moment, is called the 54321 method. So you start with your senses. So five things that I can see around me. Because mm. when I'm anxious, I'm thinking about the future, I'm thinking about the worst case scenario. Mm. But to ground myself, I just see like uh, a wall, a cabinet, a chair, a carpet, just like come back to the room. Four mm. things you can hear three things you can smell, two things you can taste, one thing you can touch. Just try to ground yourself in the moment um, because typically when the brain is anxious, it's kind of leaving the moment. Mm, that's good. And I think as we're talking about tools and resources, it's important to know there's not like just this one magic fairy totally. dust that someone's missing out on. Yeah, It's the practice of regularly implementing tools. Mm. And like any tool, you know, if I'm talking about I need to do a, a job with a skill saw and I've never touched that, like mm -hmm. the more we practice our tools and our skill sets, the more proficient we become at them mm -hmm. and therefore the, the the more helpful they are in our life. Mm. So we want to, we always recommend people to practice these things even when they don't need them mm -hmm. so that when they do need them there's been some neural pathways built and a little bit of emotional muscle behind it mm -hmm. to help support that i think another thing for both i mean it can be for both depression and anxiety is actually journaling mm -hmm. and i know a lot of personalities and temperaments have different feelings about journaling <laughs> um or even like uh, by like oh that's so girly or whatever sure. it is yeah. um but there's a lot of scientific research about how journaling helps our brains mm -hmm. and one of those reasons is because when we keep something in our head it's abstract mm. so it can constantly be changing or moving getting more intense or more apathetic mm -hmm. whereas if we actually put it on paper seeing our handwriting or typing that's allowed um, seeing it actually makes it concrete of this is what I feel this is what I remember happening and we can process something that's concrete we can't actually process something that's abstract mm. and so writing it down helps kind of encapsulate in the moment what my emotions were what my thoughts were and that's actually a really helpful tool over time to look back at how i've grown or if i feel like oh that person's really mad at me i can look back and go oh wait no it was actually kind of a small thing and we worked it out mm -hmm. it's not as bad as maybe it feels or it's not as overwhelming as it feels mm -hmm. so it can be a great um tool to see how it works over time but also it helps us stop and remember what actually happened mm -hmm. because fun fact this is the little nerd side of me when we remember something we're actually not remembering when it happened we're remembering the last time we remembered it mm. wow so if we have replayed something five times over that person's face could get progressively more and more angry. Mm. Their tone could be more and more harsh. They could be more and more disappointed in us. Mm -hmm. And so this is how we build things up bigger than sometimes they actually are because we're keeping it in our mind rather than making it concrete to be able to process it's it. It's like mm. playing the game of telephone with yourself. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. like it gets distorted more and more yeah. each yes. time. And so being able to reflect, and it's not just keeping a diary. It's right. actually like paying attention to yourself, whether it's a prompted journal, something that asks you to check in on specific things or mm. kind of open journaling, it can really help you start to 
pay attention to yourself. My wife created a resource, a grief journal for mm. this reason, because mm -hmm. grief can feel so overwhelming mm -hmm. and she just wanted to equip people with a tool. She was is working on her book, it's almost done. But ahead of that, wanted people to have a tool and she created 12 entries, opportunities for you, whether it's weekly, monthly, to check in with yourself in a grief journey. And mm. we have heard just such incredible responses of people being able to check in on themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it provides such relief when we're feeling flooded in some way. I, I'm just so thankful that you've been a resource. <laughs> it sounds so bad, but <laughs> to like when we went through our miscarriage that that you were able to like Sarah could have somebody to come to and, and walk that through. Uh, walk through that with and uh, we just like really appreciate you guys this, when you were talking about how mem like memories I feel like nostalgia also gets distorted yes. where you think about the good old days oh my gosh but then you really think about the days and you're just yeah. like that was an awful yeah. time <laughs> like yes. sir, like I, or I'll walk by like one of my my jobs that I, that I used to work at and just be like oh like there's this kind of nostalgia there but then I'm like when I talk about this it was all, like it was I had to be terrible. there at six thirty. I slept on the concrete because I was so tired. Like it, it, like rats would go, and like I'd get yelled at by my boss. I would like I'm like, why am I feeling like goodness? There's yeah. no nostalgia <laughs> in this because you, it's like the, Mike, nostalgia. You said rats. Yeah. Oh, I did. That's I did. nasty. I did. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna out what New it York was. York City, but um. <laughs> But nostalgia is so interesting in that yeah. way mm -hmm. and how it can, like, in memories of past relationships that oh, maybe yes. were not uh, <gasps> Not as good as we good. remember them Absolutely. being. Absolutely. Yeah. Block yeah. them, delete their yeah. number. You yes. don't need to go back Close there. Close the door. Close the door. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so important. It's all about staying in the moment, right? Because yeah. if we go back to those old relationships or mm -hmm. old things, we, we leave the responsibility of this moment. So whether it was really good or really bad, we have to come back to today, own the story for our beautiful and broken broken moments mm. and learn how to bring it forward. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that ties into self-regulation yeah. mm. is that I'm being present both with the challenging and the lovely. Yeah. Cause both are real. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you guys so much. I, I could talk for another three hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We could go into so many more things. We'll mm -hmm. have to have you on. Let's again. do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have another conversation at another time. We can go into, Oh, so many other other things. Many things. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to us. You can boop it with your nose, your ear, whatever can actually make it like, you know, click. Um, I like to, you know, maybe your chin, maybe, maybe your toes. You would do it with your toes. I would. Why well, can't I have kind of like monkey toes that can like pick up things. <laughs> and if there's anyone you can think of who would benefit from anything we talked about, please share it with them. Our goal is to get this in front of as many people as we can so we can impact as many people positively as possible. So so we always like to end our podcast by say, singing goodbye. So it's just two notes. Okay. Right? Just and then we just see where it lands see and hope that it harmonizes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody? I, yeah. Ready? Okay. Okay. Hope. Yeah. So as always, we like to end our podcast by saying... Goodbye. <laughs> it wasn't bad. It, it was, wasn't good. No, there was it maybe was mad. dissonance. Maybe, it was maybe jazz. there was. There it was, was jazz. jazz. It was, it was it definitely jazz. jazz. It was very it jazz. Was, like, yes, I love that you went down. Oh, only one way to go. There definitely, was no way I was hitting Black that. keys involved yeah. for sure. <laughs> Off the keyboard. Moody. moody. <laughs> <laughs>